Theistic Evolution Critique, Embryology. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. Um, and uh, the book was intended to look at several ways of looking at uh, how life developed. Of course, there's long, young life creation, which can be further subdivided, but we'll leave that out for now. There's old earth creation, which is I've used the old term, it really should be old life creation. But um, <clears throat> there is theistic evolution, but you can tell God did it. Intelligent design, theistic evolution. And there's non-intelligent design, theistic evolution. It looks like God wasn't involved, but he really was. And finally, there's atheistic evolution where God wasn't involved at all, either because God keeps his hands completely off or because he doesn't really exist. And uh, the book is actually not taking aim at atheistic evolution, although um, it uh, kind of has to argue that you need a designer and an obvious designer um, in order to make its real case, which is against non-ID theistic evolution. That's where they're really aiming. And uh, our chapter today is uh, by Sheena Tyler, got her PhD at the University of Manchester in England. And um, <clears throat> we're still, we're, this is the last chapter of part one, section one. Part one is the scientific cre critique of theistic evolution. We're gonna do a little more about that in the future. Um, section one is the failure of neo-Darwinism as a whole. And uh, so we're going to be looking at evidence from embryology, which challenges evolutionary theory. Uh, there's a summary at the beginning, and it says, how does an egg develop into the distinctive body form of an elephant as opposed to a grasshopper or a kangaroo? It remains a mystery to this day how these body forms are generated. This is a major problem for evolutionists because their claim that the various forms of life arose by changes in a common developmental path program depends on knowledge of this elusive program, or at least assumptions about it and the lack of knowledge. This chapter will demonstrate how embryological processes exhibit the hallmark of intelligent design rather than the tinkering of blind random mutations required by evolutionary theory. It will also, and here we're stepping into part two, il il illuminate evidence evidences from embryology that point to distinct types of life which exhibit fundamental differences in design between them rather than a continuous gradation of forms tracing back to a primitive com common ancestor. So this is now actually attacking part two of section one which is the idea of common descent. <clears throat> the introduction starts in 1859. Charles Darwin wrote that Embryology is to me by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of change of form. To this day, embryological mechanisms are placed center stage to explain the evolutionary origin of diverse body forms. This chapter examines whether experimental evidence emerging from embryology either supports or refutes these claims. Excuse me. Uh, the first, how did that happen? The first section investigates whether alterations in genes involved in development can generate evolutionary changes. What evidence is there for how changes in such genes might create large scale transformations to an organism's body plan? The second section looks at whether body plans are assembled according to random and unguided Darwinian processes, or are these assemblies orchestrated bearing hallmarks of intelligent design? The third section explores whether embryological development supports the idea of a continuous gradation of forms among living things, which can all be traced back historically to a primitive common ancestor. Alternatively, does the evidence suggest the existence of distinct types in nature with common modes of assembly clearly distinct from neighboring types of assemblies? 
The experimental findings discussed here have far-reaching implications to challenge the strongest class of facts which Darwin marshaled to support his theory. He's, he's going against the heart of what Darwin would have considered evidence for evolution. Part one, nature's greatest secret, the form question. Genotype to phenotype. The body plan of an organism refers to its major structural features or form by which it can be recognized. Examples are the snail with its familiar shell and the sea star with its radial arms and sucker feet. The outward visible form or phenotype is considered by most biologists to be determined by a genetic blueprint, the genotype. How this plan or form is generated remains one of the most fascinating but elusive challenges for science. This has huge implications for it is said that we will not understand evolution until we understand how organisms are produced in development. The problem of the knowledge gap between genotype and phenotype has been well recognized as the following quotes from various embryologists indicate. Emphases added. Ray Keller, one of the enduring mysteries of developmental and cell biology is morphogenesis, the process of how the heritable body plan is shaped at every stage from the fertilized egg. I'm going to spare you all the other quotes because they ba basically say the same thing, but they're there. If you want to look at them, they're in the original book. But if the mechanisms by which the programs of development translate into forms remains to be discovered, then the mechanisms underlying large-scale evolutionary change remain highly speculative since these essentially depend on fundamental changes in the black box of the developmental program. Historical sketch. Evidence is that embryological development appears to have coordinated influences, uh, coordinating influences, has been emerging over the past hundred years. In Germany, Hans Dreich, Driesch recognized that embryo parts have the capacity to generate the whole but via these parts working harmoniously together. He proposed too that the fate, identity and destination of cells is determined by their position according to a reference system of fixed coordinates. This is one approach and in fact I think in uh, planaria it has been precisely validated. In contrast, the American geneticist Thomas Hunt Morgan, and oh, I missed putting those superscripts, um, viewed the causal basis of form to reside exclusively in genes and their products rather than in fields. Morgan's student Theodosius, Theodosius Dobhansky de defined evolution to be the result of uh, changes in gene frequency with genetics as the motor for evolution. Following the Second World War, this view rose into dominance. This was the synthetic theory or the modern synthesis. Notice Dobshansky is on that side of the question. However, there was a growing recognition that our knowledge of changes in genes and their products remains insufficient to explain development and form, morphogenesis. In addition, there was increasing frustration at the lack of evidence from genetics to explain large-scale evolutionary change. One of the major tenets of the modern synthesis is that of extrapolation, the notion that my macroevolution, the evolution of organisms with distinctive, distinctly different body plans of higher taxonomic groups, is fully explained by microevolutionary processes that give rise to vari varieties within species and genera. Disagreements over this notion were so intense at a major conference on macroevolution that proceedings of the conference were never published. Paleontologists and biologists such as Stephen Jay Gould and Francisco Ayala, uh, I knew about Gould, but uh, who knew about Ayala, uh, asserted that microevolutionary events indeed do not explain microevolutionary processes. Evolutionary developmental biology, or Evo Devo, and current trends. As an attempted solution to the above unrest, evolutionary developmental biology, or Evo Devo, emerged in the 1990s when researchers proposed that alterations to genes involved in development can explain evolutionary changes. However, there are numerous problems with EvoDevo and the above ideas. These are briefly outlined as follows. For more, see chapter eight on the extended evolutionary synthesis, which is what we looked at last week here. 
without knowing, number one, without knowing the steps by which the genotype is actually transformed into the phenotype, it is a large step of faith to assume how such unknown pathways would have been transformed in evolution. You don't know what it's, it, it, you kind of just imagine how it could change. Examples of Evo Devo in action, that's number two, fall far short of providing experimental evidence of macroevolution at work. If these processes did occur, it should be possible to create large-scale transformations to an organism's body plan. However, experiments which generate mutations in genes acting on body plans tend to produce overwhelmingly defective or lethal embryos. How do you get from one class to another when there's a no man's land in between. The eminent developmental biologist Eric Davidson and colleagues focused for decades on gene regulatory networks, claiming that evolutionary change in body plans result from, result from alteration of the functional organizations of the GRNs. It is interesting to see then some of the best evidence, da evidence of Davidson forwards. These include the loss of spines in sticklebacks and the loss of eyes in cavefish. However, this represents loss of information and certainly is no evidence for the generation of novel macroevolutionary morphologies. In other words, there is no experimental evidence that a simple switch or even a series of mutations that alter GRNs can in practice lead to a new body plan. These remain speculations, not observations. For instance, as Isabel Peter and Eric Davidson imagine, as previously speculated, Mobile elements could have provided a major mechanism of GRN evolution. And, uh, you know, yeah, maybe, but no evidence for it. And there's more of that same kind of thing in that paragraph. Transformations from one form to another are never simple, this is number three, but require completely integrated transformation of form for all associated structures. And all of these must be functional. For instance, the body ch plan of highly elongated fishes differs in a number of ways compared to stout-bodied close relatives. Elongate fishes tend to have longer and or more numerous vertebrae, longer bones within the skull, and longer fins. Kind of, they pretty much have to. I'm interested in bow design. Figure 9.1a, we'll see that next slide. If in relation to the original plans a wider boat were to be constructed, the, these widths change along the boat's length, requiring the sides to be reformed and lengthened. Computer-aided design can make changes in boat design appear easy, but this is only possible only because the software was intelligently designed in the first place to enable each part of the boat to be modified in relation to the whole. And there's a the uh, boat that she has, that's her own personal boat, I think, and then uh, uh, some modifications that can be made using the computer. Um, and of course, there's some modifications to a fish that's done the same way, although you will notice that the uh, uh, circular eye has been distorted and will have to be reformed. The idea that evolutionary modifications can occur by simple changes in the timing of development is also popular. However, a report of molecular geneticist Professor Susan, Susan Cole's work regarding gene activity in chick development shows that if the timing of these genes activity does not remain tightly regulated, the tissue will either not form at all or will form with defects. Four, when a self-organizing chemistry occurs within a living cell, it comes under the guidance and constraint of the cellular system as a whole. According to biochemist Franklin Harold, new gene products are never altogether at liberty. They are, re are released into a cellular milieu that already possesses spatial structure under the influence of the existing order. Part two, development is orchestrated. Consider the novel Mr. Fan Standfast by John Buchan. Our hero Richard Hannay is wrongly under suspicion as being hotly pursued over the moors by half of Scotland's police force. They're closing in, not knowing that Hannay is an undercover British government agent and the outcome of the First World War is at stake. 
Just in time, an old friend, Sir Archie, appears, who whisks him away in his biplane to safety. In this gripping thriller, villains and heroes encounter one another in just the right times and places. Uh, and it's interesting to add that not only, not only are the coincidences amazing, but they always make sure that the co coincidences are really, really close so that uh, you get the feeling that uh, uh, a slight misstep and things could go very badly, which doesn't usually happen in real life. Uh, we next find Hane in a London underground station during an air raid. He is hunting for his arch enemy, a German spy master. Of all the places in London, Hane spots him just there at that very moment. One can see that the author has orchestrated all the plot points so as to accomplish his aim. It looks designed. If we move our spotlight, spotlight from the encounters of the novel to the embryology scene, do we see the molecular players encounter each other by chance, or do we see them in just the right time and place? I will look at this question by describing some of the key aspects of morphogenesis in different regions of the body. Recurrent themes will appear, themes related to mechanisms of information storage. One theme is positional information. Another theme is the pre-pattern which provides a template or scaffold for the organization of some subsequent structure. There is a flow of information from the first stages of development to its outworkings in final bodily form that must be highly orchestrated and choreographed to use words we will see repeatedly in the researcher's own language. Skeletal development. In the development of the limb, invertebrates, and an outwardly directed electric current plays a role in identifying the correct location of the future limb. See chapter seven in this volume. Um, obviously, when she wrote her stuff, uh, she was looking at what other people were writing too. Here, there's the electrical current and then uh, chemicals of various kinds uh, are induced which cause the limb bud to happen. But it starts with an electrical current. and. Um, in just a little bit, they're going to show you the femur, which has all these trabeculae that are just uh, right for bearing weight. The only problem is the kid's never walked in his life. So this is a pre-pattern. And, and I'll just read part D of their, uh, of the, uh, what's underneath the, I'm trying to think of the name of it, the, uh, the caption on the figure. Uh, the struts within long bones are oriented along stress lines, enabling the bones to bear these stresses. However, these struts are already so oriented during the embryo's development before any loading has taken place. This suggests a pre-pattern anticipating the loading demands on the bone. A lot of design going on ahead of time. Skipping over a couple of paragraphs, the nervous system. Development of the central nervous system requires precise and exquisitely regulated gene expression patterns, according to neuroscientists Carla Menza Sosa and colleagues. For example, the brain and central nervous system arise from the neuroprogenitor cells, which multiply and develop into nerve cells, growing very long extensions, axons and dendrites, that become connected to the target cells via synapses, or junctions between the nerve cells. The information that directs the connectivity is considered to arise in the NPCs from expression of a combinatorial code of transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that affect the expression of other genes. This combinatorial code must in turn arise and be exquisitely controlled by pre-existing information, the pre-pattern. In fact, what I have described only begins to illustrate the complexity and interconnectedness of neural development and the information necessary to accomplish that development. Again, notice that we're skipping a bit of information. There's pre-patterning information. She gives an example. There's a transcriptional code, a histone code, a cell surface code, a bioelectric code, again, all with their uh, paragraphs of explaining what that means. And then finally, um, well, uh, there's a fifth paragraph which, in the interest of time, I will skip. Uh, tooth development. 
Tooth development in mammals appears to be guided by positional information, which is tailor-made for each tooth, the shape of each tooth, grades with, uh, with its immediate neighbors, so that the dentition is integrated into a harmonious whole. And then, of course, it's coordinated with the surrounding bone so that you have tooth sockets developing at the same time. Heart and circulatory system development. Development of the heart is a wondrous and precisely orchestrated series of molecular and morphogenetic events in the view of heart disease specialist Deepak Stravistava. Heart development arises from a region of heart-forming cells in the earlier embryo known as the first heart field. These cells develop, migrate, and form into a linear tube, the heart tube. Later, a group of cells known as the second heart field migrate to the heart tube, enabling the heart tube to become elongated, then loop to the right, expand, and become remodeled into the heart chambers, atria and ventricles. Cells from the neural tube also migrate into the heart tube and are required for formation of the heart valves and compartments which separate oxygen, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So you have coordinated parts from two different uh, sections, mesothelium and endothelium, or pardon me, e epithelium. Um, a large, a very large number of genes are involved in these processes with a, ne a network of uh, transcription pathways activating each other's expression. Irfan Katharia and colleagues from the University of California report how cardiac transcription factors choreograph the expression of thousands of genes at each stage of heart development by interacting with cofactors and by binding with a constellation of regulatory DNA elements. These networks interplay to orchestrate the sequential deployment of the cardiac gene expression program figure 9.3 and keep in mind there are thousands of genes so what you're seeing is a simplified diagram. With uh, positive negative feedbacks and all that. In addition the muscles of the heart do not contract randomly and chaotically. Rather, the atria and ventricle chambers contract sequentially, which is crucial to the effective expulsion of blood. And there's talk about the uh, movement of uh, the electrical impulse over the atria, which contract more or less simultaneously. The atrioventricular node, which delays the spread of electrical activity so that the atria contract before the ventricles. And then electrical activity is then spread rapidly through the ventricles through a specialized fast conducting system or ventricular conducting system leading to the sequential contraction of heart muscle progressing from the apex to maximize expulsion of the blood. It doesn't contract just by spreading through the, uh, through the heart muscle itself. And in fact, it, when it does, you lose a good share of the contract, uh, contractility of the heart. Development of this conductive system involves the combinatorial effects of numerous cardiac specific transcription factors. And there's, I mean, there's more to this than, than what we have. However, the heart also requires a circulatory system to pump blood into, and it appears that development of both the heart and circulation are sim simultaneously coordinated. Various substances secreted by cells to regulate development growth factors orchestrate the growth of vessels in a very ordered pattern, according to cardiology researchers A.S. Chung and colleagues. For the proper functioning of the cardiovascular system, arteries, veins, and lymphatics do not have a uniform morphology, but have distinctively different structural features so as to perform different tasks. This arterial and venous specification requires the correct spatial and temporal expression of many genes or orchestrated by a relatively large set of transcription factors working together in concert. Moreover, vessels develop in relation to, uh, to their function and the specific needs of the organ in which they may be located. For instance, embryonic brain development is intimately associated with development of the blood vessels there. The brain microvasculature strictly minimizes permeability, blood-brain barrier you may have heard of, while in contrast, organs such as the liver or bone marrow 
possess a vessel structure which promotes permeability between blood cells and proteins. The nature of information. If, organization, if organisms are not intelligently designed, they must be cobbled together by non-intelligent mechanisms. Tinkering mechanisms are at the heart of modern theories of evolution. However, the above accounts indicate, that many, indicate many evidences of an intricate orchestration of patterning mechanisms to enable the concurrent coordination of various organs and organ systems integrated with reproductive behavior. And by the way, we have not covered all of it by any means. We haven't even discussed, except for one sentence, I think the liver, um, the kidneys, all kinds of stuff like that. My daughters play in a youth orchestra. During rehearsals, whenever left to themselves, the young players immediately start up their own tunes or practices. Very soon there's only noisy chaos. And also intelligent, in, uh, pardon me, it, requires the conductor to bring order out of this chaos and also intelligent information encoded in the composer's manuscript needs to be interpreted by the composer, conductor, and musicians to produce the harmonious melody. So the recourse of various authors to the metaphor of orchestration of development is interesting. For such orchestration is a signature of intelligent causation. It is not just a genetic code, but many codes together providing a rich combinatorial capacity for information storage. To the above list of codes could also be added the splicing codes, the cytoskeletal code, the apoptosis code, and the ubiquitin code. In 2016, a whole special issue of the journal Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society was devoted to the theme DNA as information. The engineer and physicist Werner Goethe recognizes that technological systems, engineered objects, and works of art did not come into existence by self-organization of matter, but were preceded by establishing the required information. He adds that it has not been shown experimentally how information can arise spontaneously in matter. It is only through guidance that processes run contrary to natural, natural laws directions to attain a goal that unguided processes could never. Um, that last sentence is the way it was in, in the book. Git has discovered that human and machine languages exhibit five levels of information. Now, I'll try to skim through this. The lowest level of information is statistical, a symbol or number of symbols. That's the Kolmogorov information. However, the mere statistical, quantitative evaluation of a symbol sequence ignores whether or not such information is meaningful. Second, there is the matter of codes and syntax, which means you have restrictions on what symbols can be used. Third, there's the matter of semantics or meaning. Fourth, there's pragmatics, meaning beyond just meaning but action that the, extent the sender expects the receiver to perform. And fifth, there's apobetics, which is the purpose. What's the whole point of this? The DNA of living things utilizes a genuine coding system and all these five levels of information are observed. Git concludes that any code system is always the result of an intelligent process that requires an intelligent originator. Thus from the above accounts, the notion of macroevolution occurring through changes in genes involved in development remains a theater of dreams and speculations. So does development reveal any story of life's history? This is our next focus. Basic types of life. According to evolutionary theory, all organisms are historically connected in the so-called evolutionary tree, in which body forms can be traced back through gradual changes from simpler body plans, continuously grading over many generations, ultimately derived from a primitive common ancestor. A contrasting view discerns distinct kinds or types of organisms that share a basic body plan and mode of development. These distinct assemblages of organisms most closely approximate to the modern family taxonomic level. Their distinctiveness argues that each group may have a separate and unique origin. Which of these two scenarios the evidence su better supports will now be explored. Hybridization data. Crossbreeding or hybridization between species is very common. For instance, one in ten species of bird is known to hybridize with another species. This suggests that the eggs and sperm from the hybrid's parents must share a developmental 
machinery that is compatible in order to produce viable live offspring. Therefore, probing the data to find which species and genera can be united together by hybridization is an evidence-based or empirical method to discern whether natural groupings exist. Analysis of this data provides strong evidence that this is indeed the case. The following provides a few examples. And those of you who've heard of baromenology are probably picking, perking your ears up at this point. The horse family, Equidae, all species within the horse family, horses, donkeys, asses, and zebras, are united by their ability to hybridize. But they do not hybridize with the nearest suggested evolutionary relatives, the tapirs or the rhinoceri. The cat family, hybridization unites various species and also several genera. For instance, the puma, puma concolor, can hybridize with the leopard, which is a completely different genus, panthera pardus. The ruddy Abyssinian cat breed never exhibits a spotted coat and neither does the seal point Siamese. However, when a ruddy Abyssinian was crossed with a seal point Siamese and the offspring was back crossed to another Siamese, the surprising outcome was a spotted cat. And there's, there's the ruddy Abyssinian, the seal point Siamese, and the Aussie cat. The bear family, Ducks, geese, and swans, I'm not going to go over all of these, you can imagine them. Cranes, pelicans, six of the seven genera uh, can breed with each other, storks. And uh, skipping over a few other comments, and there's one that uh, of interest to me is parrots apparently are all one family as well, judging from hybridization data. Um, and then they get to cleavage pattern. The spatial arrangement of cells within an embryo as they divide is known as the cleavage pattern. Various animal groups have notable fundamental differences in these patterns as the following examples demonstrate. And uh, the, he, she goes over stenophora, mollusca, arthropoda, and then the vertebrates, but the first three actually have drawings of how they divide. Uh, you notice the stenophora, have cleavages uh, that uh, start producing small and large ends and then smaller uh, cells on the top and then smaller cells on the top and then finally one more layer of small cells on the bottom with still the large cells next to the bottom there. Um, whereas the mollusca tend to have a what they call a spiral cleavage which gives you a mass that looks something like this and it's quite a bit different from that um, both in terms of its order and in terms of the you know, macromeres and micromeres not, not being as distinguished. Um, and then the insects are even more interesting where you have uh, at one point a syncytium for most of the cells. They don't actually have cell walls separating them. You know, how you get from this to this or vice versa is an interesting question. And in the vertebrates, cleavage patterns in the early embryo, embryo vary significantly between groups. Fish, frogs, chicks, and mice each have distinctive patterns of cell divisions, which are each distinct from the above mentioned cleavage patterns. So there, now you can go in all kinds of different directions. Uh, the crucial importance of early development is revealed by experiments in which individual cells from early cleavage stages are destroyed. In embryos such as mollusks, this leads to loss of adult structures descended from the deleted cells. Evolutionists have a tendency to downplay or overlook the significance of these early stages. They tend to go for the, uh, for the heckle stage, shall we say. Um, but it should be emphasized that in such animals, the early stages of development really are foundational to the subsequent development of form. In some other animal groups, cell fate is established later. How then can fundamentally different early cleavage patterns be traced to a common ancestor? The pros proposed existence of such ancestors appears to be imposed on the evidence rather than emerging from it. Cell fates. Tracing the fates of cells through development has enabled researchers to infer similarities or homologies between homologies 
between organisms. Mollusk embryos, they give the example. Uh, the prospective fates of cells in various regions of the embryo can be depicted as a so-called fate map, as can the distribution of gene products which reveal fundamental discontinuities between basic forms. And she shows some of the, you know, back, the early gastrilla of uh, zebrafish, amphioxus, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is a uh, early vertebrate, and uh, a sea urchin. And you can get an idea of which genes are, are active where. Uh, developmental mechanisms, activities within the cell, such as behavior of its internal scaffolding, the cytoskeleton, can be unique to certain taxonomic groups. And she gives the example of flies and mammals. Thus cleavage patterns, cell fates, and developmental mechanisms can be radically different between different forms of animals during these early stages. Davidson commented, um, and I'm gonna skip his larger comment in the interest of time, but he concluded, the differences among the taxa in their modes of development are anything but trivial and superficial. Hox genes and phylotypic stage. Evolutionary embryologists commonly minimize these differences by speculating that patterns of genes, notably the body axis specifying Hox gene cluster, show a common expression pattern in various animals, and that plasticity in such genes, particularly at the phylotypic stage, when members of a phylum might show maximum similarity, could generate evolutionary new body plans. However, there are several problems and flaws with these arguments. And in the interest of time, I'm only going to give you the third one. Em the embryologist Michael Richardson de demonstrated that there is no single phylotypic stage. This stage cannot be convincingly extended to the invertebrates with self eight maps and developmental me mechanisms profoundly different between the various phyla when they are supposedly at their most similar. Skipping another four paragraphs. The fossil record, oh, well, we'll just believe the fossil record. We won't try to straighten out the earlier data that we were just talking about. So what are Raff and Coffin's observation of evolution within the fossil record? The Cambrian explosion appears to the, refers to the dramatic appearance of most of the animal phyla the, at the base of the hard-bodied fossil geologic record and is global in its extent. Ralph and Kaufman make a number of surprising observations. One, highly complex animals, echinoderms, trilobites, and arthropods, and several classes of mollusks, all appeared in the Cambrian period in considerable diversity and without recognized ancestors. Boom, they're there. Two, transitional forms are largely hypothetical. Three, new morphologic structures do appear, for example, the amphibian limb, wings, but when they first appear in the fossil record, they're fully formed and are not transitional. How the various multicellular body plans arose and diverged from a common ancestor have proved to be fertile grounds for speculation because there are so few facts to restrain the imagination. Nobody really knows. Uh, skipping on, from my boat building experiments, I now have a collection of failed prototypes, such as boats that are too unstable. But in the fossil record, where are the failed prototypes? They are nowhere to be found. Instead, we find nature got it right from their very first appearances. As in the perfectly balanced cantilever bridge structures of dinosaur skeletons, such as sauropods with their massive tails, perfectly counterweighing the equally massive long neck. And uh, there's a uh, the illustration, first take a look at the cantilever and notice the remarkable similarity between the structure and that of a brontosaurus or an apatosaurus, or even a, a, a meat-eating dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus, um, with the, uh, you know, the, the long vertebrae at the middle corresponding to the bulge over the bridge in the cantilever. Skipping on taxonomic comparison of gene expression. In conclusion, the above data provide an evidence base for the existence of types that are real in nature. Distinct forms are apparent at various hierarchical levels. 
This evidence-based approach reveals that modern evolutionary theory is struggling to engage with the real world, and that much of the discussion remains highly speculative and driven by the presupposition that the diversity of life must be explained by a universal common ancestor acted on by blind natural processes. The challenge for theistic evolutionists is whether they want to align themselves, and this is the point of that whole argument, the challenge for theistic evolutionists is whether they want to align themselves with speculative naturalism or whether they are willing to follow the evidences for design and for discontinuity, both design and discontinuity, wherever this leads. Concluding remarks, in Buchan's novels, the characters spectacularly encounter one another at just the right time and place because the plot crucially depends on it. It was designed. Without Sir Archie and his biplanes, Hen A will be arrested and the spy master's schemes will not be thwarted, influencing the outcome of the war. In a similar vein, in development, the cell and molecular characters in force encounters uh, and forces encounter one another at just the right time and place because the progress of embryological development crucially depends on it. This is evident, for instance, in the placement of genes and skeleton forming cells precisely to future joint locations. The connecting of a particular motor neuron with its correct target muscle, the complex interplay of transcription factors during heart development, which is yet synchronous with the orderly development of the circulatory system, and the electric current appearing at a, the exact location to mark the future limb bud. Evidences of such orchestration are growing in abundance. And a new language is emerging with secular authors even adding superlatives. It is exquisitely orchestrated. It is increasingly untenable to recognize this as emerging from Darwinian chance processes, or even by the spontaneous self-assembly of organisms according to laws in physics and chemistry. To explain the story without recourse to a directing intelligent agency seems increasingly too far, too far-fetched. When it get comments that, as engineers realize, all of the organism's parts are in place and functional. This is only achieved if there is a higher order, higher level instruction program that orchestrates the operation of every subsystem in the overall system. Constructing these instructional programs requires complete knowledge of every subsystem as well as complete knowledge of the entire system before the higher level program can be developed, implemented, and accomplish its goal. For human vision, for instance, it is inconceivable that these compo components would just randomly integrate themselves to operate as a single harmonious unit that provides sight. Furthermore, structures such as wings are not simple and flat, but develop into marvels of engineering, ranging from efficient hovering to gliding or fast forward flight. These have far reaching implications for development of the entire body plan to suit the type of flight mode. And there follows a description of the swift, which has variable wings, which sometimes are swept back, and sometimes if in maneuvering are raised forward, much like uh, uh, some modern jets have been designed or um, small uh, play airplanes. This is the hummingbird, by the way, and this is the uh, circulation over a moth's wing, which you would think is just simple, but it's not. In Buchan's novels, Hane and his little band of comrades have instructions and clues to follow from their commanding officer. There are many possibilities as they initially speculate over these clues, but then they find the lines of evidence which best, best fit the clues. So it is with development. Evolutionary theory predicts chance processes and tinkering of imperfect assemblies. However, the evidence from development in indicates the necessity of a designing intelligence. In my mind, this points to the creator who orchestrated the intricate construction of each distinct type of body form found in nature. Now, my take on all this, we've just skimmed Dr. Tyler's comment uh, chapter, which itself skims the surface of what's known about embryology, which itself skims the surface of what can be known about embryology. The subject is complex, but not just like a pile of sand. It is exquisitely orchestrated. The idea that this just happened seems absurd. There are deep gaps between the various animal groups in their embryology. 
the idea that it is trivial to get between groups and keep the intermediate form alive, which has to happen if you're doing gradual evolutionary change, is absurd. The fossil record reveals none of those intermediates that need to be there. Uh, one can understand the hopeful monster theory. For those who want more information, I suggest reading the chapter itself and then following up the references. Dr. Tyler, I think, makes a great case for not only intelligent design, but separate creations as opposed to common descent. And the question I have is she put last because she's a transition to the next part of the book, which will discuss common descent and suggest that uh, it isn't a very good hypothesis. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. As a comment here. It's interesting that uh, some of the hybridization of the uh, horse species, the uh, resulting uh, groups or creatures that arise are totally uh, inability, have inability to uh, have sexual function and reproduce there. And so they're a, a dead end line on some of the uh, horse uh, cross breeding. Under ordinary circumstances, that's true, although there are uh, a few cases of, of meals that have turned out to be actually fertile. It's, you're correct, it's not usual. Um, the interesting thing, I've seen horse donkey crosses and I've seen horse, uh, uh, pardon not horse donkey, but horse, um, horse zebra crosses and donkey zebra crosses. And they are, uh, you know, they grow up to be big and have interesting stripe patterns. Um, in this context, I think we have to also take into account from the creationist perspective that after the flood, many of the species have to adapt and change. So during that process, uh, several changes, I don't know, at the genomic level must have um, alterated and therefore what we are seeing now probably is different what was created from the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that's interesting is that that kind of, uh, that kind of hypothesis is now testable. Uh, when one can uh, one can do either mitochondria or even more precisely Y chromosomes on horses, donkeys, uh, and zebras, and see whether there's a nice branching tree that goes back to one Y chromosome or not. Um, and if there are totally separate Y chromosomes, and I think you could make an argument for uh, maybe uh, these uh, the crosses are infertile because they weren't ever intended to be fertile. On the other hand, if the uh, if they do go back to a common Y chromosome, then you can argue that there was originally an animal that had the potentiality to to become both a zebra and a donkey and a horse, and, and the separation uh, that we see now is, uh, uh, is something that came later. Um, and what would be interesting is to see whether the Y chromosomes on, let's say, tapers in horses or rhinoceroses on hor horses um, are are markedly separate. The reason I say that is because uh, it has now become known that the human and chimpanzee Y chromosomes are strikingly different to the point of 30% new material in each and to the point of complete reorganization of the material that's, that does, that, they, that we do have in common. And so at this point, genetics may be able to uh, uh, supplement 
uh, hybridization uh, experiments to try to find uh, whether there are groupings and if so, what kind. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, Jack. <coughs> um, I certainly agree with the thrust of uh, what you've just covered. However, uh, it does ignore some of the original uh, ideas of evolution, which was uh, most clearly stated in Ernst Haeckel's ontogeny, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Now, you've already mentioned and were well aware of the fact that Haeckel's assemblage of information to support that was kind of dishonest by picking and choosing uh, different things that didn't necessarily go together. And then gilding the lily a little bit as well. Without question. However, he does point out one thing that, uh, to me, has been a major emphasis for the picture of vertebrate, vertebrate develop, evolutionary development, and that is in fish, the, basically the aorta coming out of the heart breaks up into about five branches, which then go through, uh, go between slits from the inside to the outside, which become the fish's gills. Right. In terrestrial vertebrates that have no need for gills, uh, at least some of the simpler forms, go through that same step with the formation of open gill slits, which are never used. Now, the argument has been, well, why not skip that? And just If there's a designer, uh, why not skip that? And just go directly to the appropriate development. <laughs> well, it's, uh, a, it's, it's, it's not it's, it's, it's not hard to uh, to deal with that when you get into the information. It still is was one of the major points for right. looking at vertebrate develop, uh, evolutionary development as it's presented. Yeah, um, I think that the one point that I would make is uh, try making uh, an embryo that will turn into a human or an ape, I'll take, you know, or, or monkey, um, without having that kind of split. And if the answer is uh, no, you really can't do that, then uh, the development may force that kind of, uh, de uh, the, the embryologic program may force that kind of development in a, uh, in a mammal. But isn't that a difficult position when you, as I do, totally believe in intelligent design? Uh, why be dependent on a non-functional stage? Why not skip it and go, just go direct? Well, <coughs> uh, again, if, if you can show that it can be skipped, and yet it wasn't, then I think that uh, the argument from an evolutionary point of view becomes a much stronger one. But uh, doesn't that inherently limit the powers of the designer, what you just said? Why, why couldn't he skip it? Well, for the same reason that the human embryo is not a homunculus. We Unders understood, and uh, <laughs> I, just having done this uh, this sort of thing for years with college level students, uh, it you can you can give a strong uh, when you look at the big picture a strong defense of a designer that gets involved with the uniqueness of all of the different organisms. Yeah, but uh, still there is something, and that. For the for many many decades, this was one of the major supports for the picture of vertebrate evolution. Yeah, and and it's like I say, it is a reasonable support to begin with. And the uh, it would be a killer support if you could show that humans could have gotten away without those branches and didn't anyway, because that would suggest 
that what's happening is that a certain biological pathway was chosen not for its final form, but because it uh, most closely related, uh, uh, most closely matched a fish. But again, you need, in order to make that killer argument, as opposed to kind of a sort of a reasonable one, you really have to be able to show that God could have gone a different way, but he didn't. That's quite a challenge. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, here and then I'll get. Oh. Is it not possible that the designer might have uh, sought to uh, do it efficiently? And I'm just speculating here by having a basic pattern that worked for many different kinds of organisms uh, and then modified that pattern and uh, sometimes uh, it appears like it may not be the most efficient uh, that he should have in, uh, produced an independent pattern for everything. Yeah. Uh, and I refer back to uh, snakes, for instance, that can produce legs rarely they've got the mechanism in there to do it uh, because the basic vertebrate pattern has legs yeah uh, and god may have decided well you know if you're gonna make a snake well i'll just take out the pattern uh or i'll modify the pattern or so it doesn't work it's still there whales produce legs same story. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how God did it, but uh, if I was designing things, I wouldn't want to start from the scratch mm -hmm. for everything. I'd use what was there. Yeah. Well, for snakes, if you're a creationist, God specifically took out the ability to use have the legs, um, and exactly how He did it. It's not clear, you know, maybe it would take one gene knocked out, maybe it would take, you know, 20 genes knocked out, I don't know. Um, probably one rather than 20. But uh, well, I'm going to let some other people talk about this. Go ahead. Uh, okay, and then we have, uh, maybe we can pass this back then. you that God is very practical not always as picky as we might think he should be yeah um, well the other thing is that uh, everybody's always concentrating on the similarities and that's a fair point what's often missed in the middle of that discussion is the differences you look at you look at the insect where, where apparently there's a, a syncytium early on. How do you get from uh, a syncytium to uh, a, uh, an ordered pattern like mollusks or like vertebrates have uh, with separate cells or vice versa, whichever way it would have had to have gone. Uh, the more you think about it, the more you realize there are profound differences and they are very early in the embryological development. Um, and, and it's not clear how that works. So. Yeah, well, go ahead. While he's getting the mic, you can you can comment. Okay, you're gonna wait for him. Um, I noticed one thing in your pictures back a little bit with the dinosaurs and the and the bridge back there. The um, analogy wasn't quite perfect. The dinosaur <coughs> that you're 
which was showing there had only the skeleton and obviously it didn't have the skin and the uh, muscles and everything else. So when you're looking at the bridge and comparing the cantilever systems to the, the dinosaur, the bridge is basically all a skeletal structure. It's all the same. And so the cantilever works because the members at the edge are in tension. Whereas yeah. in the dinosaur, there's no skeletal members in tension. Mm -hmm. So that part is missing. So the skeleton itself is not enough to provide the cantilevering process. You have to have a tension member, which would be the muscles and the skin. And the ligaments. And the ligaments. So yeah, yeah that's what's missing in that. Yeah, no, it's true. You have to, you have to imagine but I think most people will say there must have been ligaments that went between those uh, uh, really high, tra uh, say it's not transfers, it's the, what is it, posterior processes. Yeah. Uh, the, the ones that stick way up like that. Um, that, that, there was, that what you're seeing there is you're, you're missing the top girder, so to speak. Right. And However, the cantilever structure, this is important too, the cantilever structure depends not only upon those tensile members at the very top, but it also depends on something to support those t tensile members. Yeah, the cross uh, it, members it, the, in, the in go between. Up, up to them. Yeah, but and what's also interesting about that analogy is that, I mean, that's pretty much one of the most famous bridges in the, in the world. It was built in the late 1800s for railroad cross that first and fourth. There's actually three bridges there now. That's the first iteration. Then the second iteration was built, I don't remember now, in the mid-1900s, and was more of a suspension type. And now they're building an another one, which has gone to more of the, uh, using more of a tension system, which is either um, a cable stayed or similar to like, like suspension bridges. Most new bridges now go to a cable stayed, which is more efficient. And so actually the dinosaur being with only the structure of the skeleton with the large elements and then the tension members being the thin string tendons and it's ligaments. It's really thick it's, string. <laughs> yeah, but that's actually a more efficient way to do it. So our understanding of engineering has evolved, if you want to put it that way, from a heavy, large structure to more of a thin, efficient structure that actually mimics more of the, the nature process yeah. than. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, to think um, that it's going to be difficult to do a suspension bridge type of structure for, the, uh, uh, for a dinosaur. Because then what you'd have to have, instead of a whole bunch of big things sticking out, you'd have to have one big peak that supported all the weight. Yeah, that would be a little weird to have a real <laughs> spike on his back. <laughs> To have a, a super camel, so to speak. Yes. Um, in my mind, I take this back to theology. God, who orchestrated things so exquisitely in the universe and in our bodies, actually created something that's able to tell him no. You know, and Ellen White says that the greatest miracle God can do is to change a person's mind mm -hmm. to work there. So to me, it, it, it's amazing what God has done out there and what he's doing in our minds and where we're headed. I love that thought. Come in here again. Well, basically, with respect to the comment I made earlier, uh, the point that, that Leonard made is really an effective uh, interpretation to present to help students understand mm -hmm. uh, that uh, using a common d design, uh, this could even be presented as evidence for a common design. Yes. Rather than having a separate one for each one, but it can also be used for the opposite. But you you brought up something I think that's, uh, and this is 
something I'm fascinated with that was very interesting is you uh, showed an early uh, insect uh, blastula stage going into, it would go into a gaster a little bit later. What is especially fascinating in the insects is that uh, this pr produces a an organism that is not in the adult form in all cases. Uh, in the spectacular one, this produces the uh, caterpillar. Yeah. But the butterfly developed from a completely different set of developmental tissues. Doesn't use the same the same materials at all. They are all just sort of dumped off to the side, and you have special grouping of uh, very powerful cells that start a whole new process rather than reusing what was there already. It's almost as if the caterpillar is reduced to an egg again and has to regrow. Well, in a sense, uh, if you look at the development, it's more like the cater caterpillar was a dead end that you had to get beyond. Yeah. And to do so, rather than using the original materials, it's new. It, it, they have been such an important tool in understanding mm -hmm. development. Uh, and the fascinating part is that both programs are apparently contained in the DNA and whatever extra informational systems there are, um, and, and they don't get mixed up with each other. Yeah. Well, as you get into it further, it's fascinating that uh, in very early insect development, there is a female-only contribution that does not come from the nucleus that determines the anterior versus the posterior end of the developing embryo. You, you mess that up a little bit, you get a developing insect with either two heads or two tails, which is obviously non-viable. But it's, it's a matter of putting the right you might say protein hook uh -huh. for a particular set of active uh, products of active genes so that one only goes to form tail and the other only goes to form head. And you know, and I mentioned that Sheena Tyler is talking about embryology. We skimmed over what she said. She's skimming over the total literature that there is and everybody knows that beyond the literature that we have now there is even more information that we just don't know yet it's it's amazing to think of how much information there is about how embryos mm -hmm. form how true. Oh, one comment here I just thought I'd mention the interesting theory that uh, a worm-like organism mated to an insect, and this is the way you got the caterpillar butterfly sequence. This is, there's a book about this. Uh, this is a, uh, a suggested theory. We usually don't see that reproduction between such different organisms is viable. It's almost as if it was designed that way. <laughs> well, uh, next week we will launch into the question of a separate ancestry versus the universal common ancestry tree. And uh, here we're starting to veer slightly from the idea of, uh, of evolution, but God guided it, and you can tell. Because when you start talking about separate ancestry, that's not, strictly speaking, God guided evolution. Uh, and that was one of the things that I found fascinating is that they're trying very hard not to, you know, do internal shooting uh, between various forms of intelligent design. But if you follow the data, 
it's starting to look like well, maybe some forms of intelligent design are better than others. Mm -hmm. And so kind of keep that in mind as we start looking at this next section. Uh, anyway, come back next week and we'll, uh, we'll get started. <laughs>